Welcome back, you lovely Marvels. How in the heck are you today? Hi, Dina. We're back for another episode. <laughs> hey, Gwen. We're back today. We are. We are. We are. And today, um, we want to talk about this very loaded word, IQ or intelligence. Yeah. Um, you know, because it comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. And as psychologists, a licensed psychologist, we are... It's part of our wheelhouse to be able to diagnose and assess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, all of us actually that have gone through a doctoral level training in psychology are trained to yep. assess for cognition. Yep. Um, we used to call it intelligence, but I guess this is the conversation we're going to have today, which is what, why, why, why all the heat with the word intelligence? Well, I think that people really don't know. The first thing I remember learning and that we teach in cognitive assessment or IQ, if we're teaching the ways, the Weschler adult intelligence scale, and then there's kid versions, is what is intelligence? And it really, for uh, psycho psychologists doing testing, intelligence is really defined by the test they're using because different tests assess for different parts of, like you said, cognition, or what the authors of the test, sort of, I'm doing the air quotes for those of you that are listening, um, what they define as intelligence and kind of the classic one of people will you know, just say, oh, what's your IQ? And so for the lay audience, you know, what is IQ? What is it like your number, right? <laughs> so I always am like, well, okay, so what, first of all, which test are we talking about? Because the number that you get is going to be different on something like the Weschler or the Stanford Binet, those numbers mean something different. Um, and then what a lot of people don't know, unless they've been through testing themselves, is there's all kinds of testing that we do, like in, in a, an intelligence test. So something like the WACE has a whole bunch of subtests and it has two sides to it. It's a, it's what we call, um, performance IQ and then verbal IQ. And by verbal, we mean like, we ask you questions about things you've learned in school or ask you to solve math problems or ask you about vocabulary kinds of things. Those are all uh, what we call deemed verbal. And and those kinds of things, trying to figure those things out. And those used to be called nonverbal, but now they're called performance. So you have all these, I, I, I believe I'm correct still that there's at least 10 uh, on each side. So these tests take a long time to administer. And if you've been through like, for example, neuropsych testing and you got a report from those, that's nice because you can tell different things from each of those subscales. And then you can tell other things like processing speed and do they tend to be strategic in their thinking? And um, do they, does their uh, ability to do things, uh, is it affected by anxiety? So there are certain tests that are really sensitive to that, like doing math in your head and stuff like that. So there's things beyond just that one big, what we call full scale IQ number, there's performance, there's verbal, and then there's all those subtests that try to get at different constructs of intelligence, again, air quotes. So things like, what did you learn in school? Does, this, does someone have a big depth and breadth of vocabulary? Do they have a, you know, a lot of words that they know? And when you ask them what that word means, did they give you a rich answer? Or do they give you a kind of surface one dimensional answer. And then all those things and why we have to get trained in it is those kinds of answers we have to uh, assign numbers to based on how we learn, like, is this a really deep answer? Is this a superficial answer? Is this answer just wrong? Did we say, you know, what is a bottle? And you said, well, it's like something you put water in and carry, you know, like they give you a definition of a bucket, which wouldn't be a bottle, right? So there can be wrong answers. Um, and then you add all these points up and it gives you a lot of this information and the newer version can give you things like um, uh, working memory index, processing speed, um, uh, instant and then delayed recall. And there's a lot of other things that this test tends to build in each time it's revised, which is nice because you can get more information from it. Uh, and so a neuropsychologist and someone who's using a, an intelligence or, or cognitive assessment well, because we're trained in this, a lot of times they don't even tell the client like their number, their full scale IQ, 
or when I've done it and I've given feedback, if I give them that, it's with, we go through a whole session or two giving feedback on the test. Because I don't want you to just know your overall number. I want you to know like where your strengths are, where your growth areas are, where are areas that you might need a lot of support because you didn't do, do well on the test. Um, and the idea is we want to get an assessment of how you think and how you problem solve and how you sort of do those tasks. That's what we mean by intelligence, right? That said, one of the other first things you learn when you're learning about any assessment, whether it's projective or cognitive or personality testing, is sort of the evil history of these tests, right? I mean, one is kind of the eugenics movement and all this terrible history about, oh, uh, not too long ago, people of color aren't as smart because they don't do well on these tests. Well, the tests were, de were developed and normed on white college kids. So if you didn't belong to that demographic, it's just not going to test you well. And the great example I always give my students is my wife was a third grade teacher in a very, very small town in Montana for several years. And she remembers um, what we call standardized tests, asking questions about the subway. And the kids had no idea. They thought it was like the sandwich store. A kid that grows up in a town in Montana in the 90s with 400 people in the entire town has never heard of a subway. And so now you can see they're going to get that item wrong. And it's a good example of like a cultural difference that would make you not do well on those tests. And if you're talking about basic knowledge that you learn in school and a lot of those kinds of things, that could vary, but they can also be what we call culturally biased. There's a lot of, there's no test that's said to be completely culture free. Some try to get close to there with like symbols and pictures and things like that. But there's no one test that's said to be completely culture free. So there's the context of, your results that need to be taken into account. And that's what we're really doing in that feedback session. It's not just giving you your numbers, but what do they mean for you? What do they mean in the context of your background, um, cultural background, learning background, your functional background, all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you're having one of those tests and it takes a long time to do all that kind of testing in addition to other things for autism, for example, if you're gonna get what we call a full battery, um, because it, it garners a ton of information and a licensed psychologist is going to look at that information in a way that is sensitive to all those things that I'm talking about. Like they're going to know about biases that could affect that, for example, right? You could have someone that does not so well on the, the verbal side, but just knocks it out of the park on the performance side, which is not typical, like normed. People usually are about even on each. And there's even like a scale of how far apart they have to be to, to have it be clinically significant or statistically significant. Um, and I've had a lot of clients like that that are really, really good at the performance stuff, but the book learning and that kind of thing that you tend to get like K through 12, not as great at, doesn't mean they're not smart as smart or intelligent. It means we're, we're, we're looking at what that version of that test, how that test defines intelligence, right? And then there's other tests that test intelligence. There's um, the Stanford Binet is one. There's ones that try to look at constructs of cognition and that are pure memory tests, like the Ray complex figure. If you have to do these, you have to copy these figures and then see if you can remember parts of it not too long away and then further away. So we have a whole bevy of tests that we can choose from um, to figure out and to try to get an idea of kind of what's going on in there. But intelligence, I just want to kind of demystify for the audience. Um, when someone says, oh, what's your IQ score? I never really, A, I never want to tell them, and B, I kind of go through the spiel because it's, it's a bit of a meaningless number overall, unless it's a super high number, and then you know someone did really well on everything. Um, and that could just mean they're really good at book learning and that kind of stuff. You know, traditionally, like American presidents have been high, except for... The, the most recent one. And people would, I, I, I'm just gonna bash Trump a little bit here because I'm just gonna get political. People would ask me, oh, but don't you think Trump is smart? I mean, look, he's like manipulating. And for me, the vocabulary is the clue that he's not. He does not have a broad range of vocabulary. He uses the same words, he kind of repeats them. He doesn't understand um, a, a full context of words. He misuses words and those kinds of things. And that's usually a really good indicator especially for someone who supposedly had an Ivy League education that he's not very bright, right? But it would be really interesting to test him 
and see what's in there because I'm making assumptions just based on these observations. Um, and obviously I'm biased and those could come out looking totally different than what my guess would be, which is also the beauty of doing the testing. You, I've been surprised lots of times when I've tested people and I'm like, wow, that's not what I expected. So it really does try to get in there and see what's going on in terms of, like you said, cognition rather than like intelligence. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I think what we're working with too is this idea of who came up with the construct of intelligence, um, yep. right? So we, we start there. We've got all these tests. And I think the thing that I'm struck with, especially as I do more and more and more work with the mm -hmm. neurodiverse community, right? Mm -hmm. What do I see? I realize, and I've also learned this from my neuropsych colleagues, the brain isn't just in a jar on top of your body. Yeah. You know, yeah. it is connected to a sensory motor system. Sure. So what if your hearing, you're like, we know there are sensory sensitivities and differences in, in yeah. autistics. We know yeah. this. Yeah. So what if my visual processing, you know, um, is off in some way, yeah. shape or form yeah. and I can't necessarily make out the words. If I can't read that and I give you a very low score, does that mean that I'm, that I'm, I don't have a high IQ? No, it means that I have a visual processing problem. You know right. what I'm saying? That's right. And yeah. so, you know, as much as like, we've got different assessments, right? We've got the Weschler set, which is kind of the gold standard set, which by the way, is not allowed to be able to use in public schools because of its uh, torrid history. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're not allowed to use the whisk in Ooh. elementary or um, yeah, because it's culturally biased. So they oh, don't allow they you. Use? So they they the KTEA is usually what districts oh, use. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we've got our stand for Binet, which is really sensitive at the tails, meaning very mm. very gifted and individuals that will struggle with doing certain things. You know, like yeah. this is the way that intelligence is you know measured, um, yeah. right? We've got the C-Tony, which is like nonverbal. It's, right. a, it's a language-free, as much motor-free test, right? right? But then right. people will be like, I don't accept a nonverbal IQ. And it's like, why? Yeah. Why don't you? Yeah. So I, and you know, and as an assessor too, we're allowed to test limits. Meaning, yeah. you know, there's some things that are timed. Yeah. There's um, ways that you have to actually deliver the administration. But yeah. if you're like, you know, I wonder if I, I wonder if I gave this person more time. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if I gave them one more prompt. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Especially then if you're you testing can, someone that you think might do well with that yeah. little bit of support, like with just times. more support. And yeah. you, you like, and I did this before, you know, mm -hmm. if I was like needing to establish if time would be beneficial for a collegiate student, let's just say, yeah. Yeah. I would always score the, I would always keep a score of, what they looked like at time. Yeah. And then yeah. I would test the limits and give them the time and show the difference in the scores. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. I would do that just because I think that that's a responsible thing to do clinically, yeah. especially yeah. if I'm, you know, the purpose of that is to really see what a student can do with more time. With, with or more time. Yeah. yeah. Can do with more context. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I can inflate or deflate someone's IQ mm -hmm. that way. Oh yeah. So yeah. how valid is this? And and I and I you know I think for me we just don't pay enough attention to the sensory motor systems in the yeah. way in which we think about how someone is able to perform. I mean, yeah. think about you know if you're under constant stress and sensory bombardment, should we mm -hmm. test your IQ? Yeah. And you have to do it kind of like in one setting and it's a long time and people get fatigued and Oh yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I had a person that I work with in my internship who had cerebral palsy mm -hmm. and I don't know who in their right mind gave this poor guy a waste because it has, you have to like move blocks around and stuff like that. And they, he obviously came out looking, you know, uh, what the word they used then was mentally retarded, which was a horrible label. Um, and he thought he was, you know, and I sat and talked oh with him God. and I could just tell by uh, the discussions we had, he was way smarter than that. So I explained to him, why that would skew that and i came up with a a way to kind of like you're saying test the limits how long would it take him to to stack three of the blocks that you have in that test uh, i timed him and then i went around and and did that with a bunch of my classmates 
and got an average number for how long it takes someone without a motor problem to stack the three blocks. And then yeah. for him, and then we figured out a ratio to adjust all the scores. Now, yes, we we didn't give the test standardized and it wouldn't be something that would like hold up in court or whatever, but he came out way higher. Of course. And actually was in the more in the most superior range for intelligence. And we were able to talk to him about that as sort of a therapeutic tool for him. Now mm -hmm. the, the bugger was he was on, he was getting social security because he couldn't work for obvious reasons. So they he had to have these low scores to still get SSI. So that happens a lot too. But it was so, you know, he had, was so dejected and felt his self-worth was so low because he'd been labeled not smart with one of these tests. And it took someone like me to say, wait a minute, that test wasn't used properly and that's terrible. But yeah. then we also talked about leaving it in his file so he could continue to get social security because that's a whole nother system that isn't fair either. It sort of reminds me what you're talking about. How can I figure out for this kid to do better in school? Extra time, yeah. quiet room, me not yep. sitting there staring at them while they're doing it, whatever it would oh, yeah. take. Right. Yeah. 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 And you know, you know, this you you, you bring up a systemic issue, right? That, that we've covered actually on the show quite a bit, yeah. which is yeah. this yeah. idea of not disabled enough or those tweeners yeah. that are kind of like in the middle. And it's like, yeah. oh, wait a minute, you know, oh, I have to deflate something in order to, yeah. you know, and it's ridiculous. Or yeah. this idea, I think in our learning system right now, it is we gotta wait till you fail until we approve or see that you need something. Yeah. And I, I think yeah. that a lot in behavior, you know, where it's like, if you have no outward behavior that is, I'll say maladaptive. I know yeah. a lot of people don't like that word, but Within it is maladaptive. Fit that system. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean, just because there's an absence of that behavior doesn't mean that that person isn't struggling internally. That's right. Yeah. And so I think that that's really tough because then now we're only looking at externalized behaviors, no internalized um, behavior mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. all. And I, and I, so for me, it, it's really interesting because a lot of, you know, if you're a good masker and we've talked about masking a lot yeah. Yeah. on the show, um, a lot of people don't realize that you are a functioning depressed person. Like, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm, whatever. Well, well, I was thinking with the, intel the intelligence test, with the cognitive test specifically, um, I got pegged as a kid as being impulsive a lot. And mm -hmm. it was usually, it was frustration. We've talked about that before. But like mm -hmm. a lot of the um, non-timed tests or the timed tests that are like puzzles or things you have to solve, I would get flustered. And then now my ability to focus on it is going to go out the window. And as yeah. I've gotten older, I, you know, as you mature, I'm like, I'm going to give myself permission to take my time. I'm going to give myself permission to relax and really, instead of just getting up immediately, I'm going to stick with it. Because before it was like, I couldn't do it immediately. I'm stupid. Why try it all? That mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the intelligence. That has to do with that kind of like you're talking about. It's something else besides intelligence that if you didn't pick up on that, you didn't know that, right? And that's yeah. another thing you can ask about outside the test itself is a, a little bit of what we call protocol analysis. And that's after you do that, ask the person what was going through your head as you were doing that test. And oftentimes that's the nugget for me where they'll say something like, well, you know, I figured I didn't know the answer right away, so I'm stupid, so I'm not gonna try. So, oh, that's really important to know. I mean, especially therapeutically and maybe even accommodation wise versus you, you're dumb because you don't know the answer to this, right? right. That's, right. And that's and that, not something you would do in a in typical administration, but you could learn so much from that. Well, and I think I really feel like that's the that's the that truly is, in my mind, where the clinician mm -hmm. expertise yeah. is necessary. Yeah. Because you know, why do an evaluation in the first place? I mean, mm -hmm. the reality is we're doing evaluations for a certain reason. We shouldn't just be like, hey, you want to know your IQ? Come mm -hmm. on in. Like, yeah. th that's yeah. not why we do that, you know? Yeah. We do it because we're facing something. I feel like it's a it's a way to sleuth 
the way the brain is working, right? Right, and, right. You know, Dana was saying earlier, like Dana, you were talking about verbal and uh, your verbal, this kind of VIQ, verbal IQ, mm -hmm. verbal reasoning, perceptual reasoning, nonverbal reasoning. Mm -hmm. But we also have, you know, in that test, we've got speed and working memory mm -hmm. and this idea of speed, which is how quickly can I do things that I know, right, yeah. that I've mastered. Um and this idea of working memory, which is how many things can my brain juggle at one time? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if you have any attentional problems, oh, it's gonna yeah, your working yeah. memory is gonna look really, really poor. Yeah. Um, and, and if usually, you're anxious, that's a really yeah. hits working memory. Hard. Yeah, you're yeah. gonna see, right, right. That's right. And so, mm -hmm. what what's the reason, you know, yeah. for that? And I really think that's where clinicians need to actually test limits, and they need to explore what is happening yeah. for somebody because. In that in that example that you gave, we didn't test we that the result of that isn't that that person isn't smart. The result yeah. of that is that based on his cumulative lived experiences, his messaging is that I'm yeah. not I I'm why is learned helplessness basically yeah. That's so what we so from. on that test, he earns those scores for that test. That's all those numbers mean. Is that person earned those scores on that test? We can't really say that person is intelligent or not. Mm -hmm. And that's right. the other thing we learn when we're doing that testing is you're testing the constructs that this test says you're testing, which is something like, you know, how fast can they think on the fly, especially if they're anxious. And, you know, so instead of just saying, oh, they can't do it when they're under pressure versus that maybe this is an area for them that they need some support or not be right. under pressure. Yeah. Right. Or they really need more time to mm -hmm. understand and collect themselves mm -hmm. and think about a problem and that right. pressure. So yeah. we see this a lot that time that timed things can suppress people's performance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it makes them nervous and anxious. And then, yeah. you know, based on their history too. But I mean, I think for us, you know, you know, what is our channel about? Our channel is about understanding, mm -hmm. being seen. Yeah in a safe place and, mm -hmm. and being understood, right? Yeah, right. And that IQ and intelligence is really such an interesting construct today. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, it's, it's really about, I think, how do you think your best? Like at yeah, your best, yeah, what, what yeah. are the conditions for that for you particularly? And those are the conditions you wanna put yourself in most of the time. Yeah. And it reminds me as you're saying that, so we're talking about cognitive and IQ <clears throat> and this is different than aptitude. So I'm thinking yes. a lot of the tests yes. that I had, like you get in grade school and junior high are aptitude tests. What that's telling you is where your interest areas lie, first of all, and be uh, what you might be good at, right? So that might be something like, I always got like, I always got, oh, you'd be good at social sciences. And I wanted to be a veterinarian. And of course, they ended up being right all those years ago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they can also, I mean, I'm thinking too of, of like, I love when I have to have, not that I love spending money on those things, but when you know, I have to have someone come to my house to pick something that's beyond what I'm able to do. But I always marvel at like electricians. I know. How do you oh. how do you understand this stuff? And they're like, oh, blah, 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 and blah, 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 blah. And, that is an aptitude, right? So that is, yes, that yeah. person's trained in that, but clearly that person understood those kinds of things really well to begin with. And yeah. then they gravitate towards it because they have an aptitude for it, right? Yep. So when I tell people, oh, I did really well in grad school and they say, oh, that's great because grad school is so hard. And it was, that's for sure. But I also feel like I had a little bit of a leg up because it was such a strong aptitude of mine. It, did, it wasn't hard to understand the concepts. There was a lot of work to get those things done, but the concepts were like, oh yeah, that makes sense. If you had me put in an electrical panel, I would not oh. have any idea what to do. So that's a that's a difference yeah. between aptitude and intelligence, right? Two right, totally and achievement. And like, achievement. And so the other, yeah. the other word is achievement here, yeah. which is achievement yeah. is usually a result of what you've been exposed to and have practiced yeah. at. And we yes. usually see those things like reading, and yep. math and yep. what like, and, and that IQ tests or, you know, um, are looking at, and that's why they're biased because yeah. the verbal section of those tests are asking you about these general facts that you yeah. should have been exposed to in 
good quality education. But what if you weren't, right? Yeah. But what yeah. if you weren't, right? Yeah. Um, because, you know, um, but you know what's so interesting, Dana, as you talk about aptitude, because I'm spatially deaf, like I have a deficit in spatial awareness. I swear uh -huh. I do. Uh -huh. And so, you know, classically um, in, in, in undergrad and grad school, you know, you test college students in, mm -hmm. in psych experiments. This right. is the, this right. is the, you know, the normal. They're the and, lab rats. <laughs> um, right. And I did yeah. a rotation. Um, I worked as a research assistant in, um, a, for a cognitive psychologist. Uh -huh. And we had to take the, the, the test. And this was like, you know, 30 years ago, we, there was a, a, um, an image. And then the question was, what would this image look like if you, if you turned it 180 degrees oh, or you God, turned it yeah. 90 degrees? Yeah. I <laughs> could not. And to this day, it's like, well, about how many square feet is that Gwen? I don't oh, no. know. Yeah. And then what, you're, what that's that a really mean? good example. You, you, my wife's the same way. She cannot do that. No, I, for some strange reason, can do it, but I have to get my body involved. I have to, because I'll do this like when I'm doing a screw, I'm like righty tidy, and then I have to like go down to where it would be, and then I yeah. can see it. I can't right. just do it in my head. I, I have to get my body involved. Right. And so there's clearly some other system that I'm using versus people that can do it all in their head. Right. And that's just right. different brain wiring. There's nothing you can do. That's right. To train that, to get over it, you know, whatever that is. And That's so very right. certain things are going to select for that. Like if you're an astronaut, you need to have that capacity. So you and I could Or an engineer. Or an engineer. Right. Or an yeah, engineer. Or, an or yeah. Right. Yep. Like that's just yep. not going to be like, that's just not, um, you know, as, as a good friend of ours say, like, that's not my ministry. This yeah. is not, oh, there you not go. mine. You would design you know? one of those buildings that has like the stairs to nowhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I mean, I think, so I think in this conversation, it's like, don't let, oh my gosh, I feel like this is a conspiracy theory, but like, don't let the bigger establishment tell you if you're smart or not. You yeah. know, really, <clears throat> right? Yeah. Like really think about what you're good at, what comes yeah. easy for you, what you naturally yeah. what can you do. Like? Right. Right. What twirls you. Right. You were talking about aptitude. We recently, where I teach, we have stopped requiring the GRE for admission. Yeah, because that's great. because it's it just tests people that are good at standardized tests with that general information. What's a better What's a better indicator for us is how they did in four years of undergrad. Yes, than a three hour test under the yes. gun, right? And yes. that's sort of along those same lines too. Yeah. But, yes. Yeah. I'm really happy about this test blindness. You know, we're yeah. moving away yeah. from SATs. We're moving away. Yep. Um, and what I really love about that one, I'm by like when I took the SATs <clears throat> and I got my results back, I was like, um, well, I'm not taking <laughs> these again because if I do, I will prove oh. that I'm dumb. Like you just prove I, that that test you didn't do well on that test. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah. and I'm a terrible standardized test taker. I did, I did the an ACT and the oh, GRE yeah. and did terrible on both. I know. I mean, the yeah. GRE I studied for for a long time. And, you know, what What? What did I get from the GRE? Uh, the word pedantic. And I don't know, <laughs> like uh, whatever, right? That was like so stupid. But I'm really um, happy about this because all it does, I think, is – and there is a piece of this, which is yeah. – it does separate people that are one just kind of naturally good standardized test takers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the other is it also does separate the people who got a lot of like standardized test coaching. Right. Right. Or because, yeah. And had money to do that. Or like you yeah. said, went to an affluent school and had different learning environment right. and it's very right. culturally so it, oppressive. Yeah. 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 And so, um, I, uh, you know, my daughter is in high school and something that they're really helping them understand is, what colleges want to see now is, is something similar to what you said, Dana, which mm -hmm. is we want to see that you grew every year. Yeah. You did yeah. something more in your sophomore year. You did something different in and more in your junior. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you did. So, so you added new experiences. Yeah. You did additional things. That's actually what they're looking at now. It's yeah. not, you know, and I'm so happy yeah. For that, I, I, like from a, again, from just my own bias, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, because I, I just don't think, I think 
what do we want? You know, we, we want people who stay in it and are engaged mm-hmm. and are curious and yeah. want to do good for people. Like these are the, these yeah, are the what are things you are, tried? Yeah. What did you like? What didn't you like? And that, yeah, because yeah, that, that's what you should be doing. College yeah. students with some self-awareness and really nice emotional management skills, like yeah. get out of yep. town, right? I know. <laughs> that's where we're going to really have some thriving happening right. instead of the highest rate of college students returning back home. The yeah. highest rate ever in our history. Really? Yep. Wow. College failure and coming back home right now. And, and do, do you think that's because of the all the changes and everything and they can't, they just can't, it's not the material so much as it is. The Maybe it's, there's realm. such a big, there's such a big chasm now between the old guard is still teaching at universities yeah, maybe. and how younger people learn, right? Yeah. Cause I'll have yeah. my students say, I really like classes with you because we can challenge you and you don't like get mad at us. And I'm like, I want you to challenge me. <laughs> That's They're what like, college well, not, is about. Not all the professors feel that way. They're like, Hey, I'm the expert and you better shut up. And I'm, I'm thinking, does that happen at universities too, where students are like, you know, these a, a <clears throat> lecture hall with 300 students and you take a test and you don't do well. And then what, right? That's one of the main reasons I dropped out initially when I first went off to school. Yeah. I was in a chemistry class of 300 people. I had no idea what was, what was going on. That's what was happening. crazy. 300 crazy. people. That's yeah. nuts, Dana. Yeah. Nuts. Yeah. Yeah, that and everything else that, you know, in hindsight yeah. made sense. But yeah, that's yeah, it's the yeah. highest rate returning home. Wow. Yeah, we've got a lot of failure to thrive at the at the collegiate mm-hmm. levels right now. Um, mm-hmm. Or or kids actually graduating college and not being able to go, like not kind of launching into their life. So coming back. Home. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. So, so there's a lot of that as well. Because they can't afford anything everything's so expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No joke. Yeah. Um, <sighs> All right, Marvels. Well, you know, if you have any thoughts about intelligence um, or cognition, we haven't even gotten into the other things like emotional intelligence. There's lots of different kinds of mm-hmm. intelligence out there. I mean, mm-hmm. Howard Howard Gardner is that? Am I getting his name right, Dana? Is that isn't that, did the EQ? isn't the multiple that- intelligence guy? That's the multiple so. intelligence guy. Yeah. Anyway, so. um, gosh, so I guess that's another thing that came out of the GRE. No, just kidding. It's not. It came out of the GRE. <laughs> but um, what are your thoughts about in, in intelligence and and what that means in today's world? Yeah. Uh, we'd love to. to or what has it. been your experience getting assessed? Because I, I hear yeah. a lot of horror stories. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. true? Isn't that true? Yeah. Thanks, Marvels. We will see you in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye.